the other world. In other words, the priest is to reflect otherworldliness in his speech. Well, after my conversion, that's a footnote, after my conversion, my father Vladimir, right there, <coughs> show him, show him. Father Vladimir, my spiritual father, right there. He said to me, now that you're Orthodox, now you go to church, now you must go to church, the local Boston church, and stand through the whole services, and uh, when almost everybody's gone, then you can go home. I said, I can't stand it. I'm bored to the max. Why? Well, because the whole thing's so warm, it's so interesting, you just they come there and they talk about the gossip, everybody stretches in church, they just whisper, and they show up in the latest dress, and high heels, and you know, joujoux, and so on. And um, <coughs> I find it very boring. He says, what about sermons? Well, it's the most boring of them all. Why? Oh, because when you come to sermon liturgy, you're exposed to otherworldliness, to a mystical supper, to a whole presence of God. And there's with you. If you're a living soul, you certainly feel something going on. And then the priest comes out, out and in a very worldly manner, we choose something, ends up that we're supposed to fix the roof and need money, and finally <coughs> sort of dampening the whole thing, and you are robbed of that which you receive in the uh, liturgy. And he said, well, you're very judgmental. I said, well, that's, that's one of my good qualities. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to me this, try. When I went to Father Adrian, the monastery, after the liturgy was over, I was just craving to hear the word of God. He gave a sermon right after the gospel on usually the Russian expression is um, explanation or commentary on that particular passage. And he didn't give any big sermons or give talks and parallels, any kind of beauty or anything. He just explained what it's supposed to mean, especially because Slavonic gospel, or the gospel that is used in Russian church, is read in Slavonic. And Slavonic is a little different than Russian. It's almost like Shakespearean English, when you have to think a little. And some words are different. For example, life in Slavonic is the same word as in Russian, belly or stomach. So every time we talk about the life, he talks about bellies. So you see the image of the, the, the belly button. And so it's sort of, it's very distracting, to say the least. <laughs> and so he needs a little explanation. But at the end, and so usually sort of he explains, not much to him, just explain. But at the end of this, he comes out, he's filled with grace. He's absolutely inspired. He might be sick, he had a stomach ache, nevertheless, he's inspired what's going on. And so he comes out, almost floats out like on his boat. All burning, inspiring, then he starts <coughs> screaming, or he starts telling you, sharing with you that which actually is burning out in him, who wants to pour out, he can't hold it. And when you stand there, you begin to realize that that the mystery of the, of the experience of the liturgy, plus the very subject he's talking about, usually again choose either on the subject of the gospel or like a saint or a feast day. So he, plus, he, whether he wants it or not, involuntarily, he comes out with how he feels, how his love accepted this very reality. And so you stand there and you are caught in other words. You understand? In other words, not just the gospel, not just the story of the day, the feast day, but and not only the mystery which gives him power, almost like an energy, but you feel that he is sharing, that he is, he's not the little say, well, I have the experience of the Holy Spirit and now I have it. No. He, he lives it. The way he says, you feel you're caught, almost just like on the roller skates, you just shh, upwards. See? Now, of course, to present, to expect from everyone, it's difficult. 
And so when I became priest, I said to Father Nazim, he said, you know, I, I had strange experience after my first few, few liturgies in the altar. I said, how am I supposed to look at it? I called him. And he says to me, God protect you from making any attempts of seeing and feeling any ministry. <coughs> Be simple. Fear any kind of, uh, of uh, sort of mystical experience. God protect you. Nothing to do. <coughs> but be honest and simple. That's the best thing. You can be real. Otherwise, you very often become a foe. Therefore, the true um, sermon giver or homilist is first of all to be honest, sincere, but not worldly, as we all are. Therefore, we come out, and the first thing should be this. Sermon is this point two. Sermon is divided into four categories, just like symphonies. A good symphony has four parts. First symphony is introducing main theme, or two or three themes as introduction. Second movement introduces a new theme. Absolutely different. <coughs> Third movement is crescendo, or combination of those both. And the last part is conclusion, or the result of all that. Therefore, the first part should be an introduction, or introducing the main theme, or what we mean. Second part should be introducing a second theme, could be opposite, or two themes, or two ideas, something opposite of the first. Third is the blending of them, or clash, or uh, combination, or binding, or whatever, or choking one. And the last one must be a result how you want what you're talking about to affect the listener. Therefore, you come out and you say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You do not say good morning, good afternoon, and all that. That is a part of our world of society. You come out, it's not, a sermon is not a talk. A sermon is not a conversation or a time when you sort of <coughs> chat along. A sermon is when you are to say something of utmost importance, matter of life and death, and you are forced to speak because of the abundance of your spiritual experience. What if you don't have the spiritual experience? What if you are a total zilch, you're an uh, American fish, or something like that? What if you're suffering like that? What do you do? No, you don't. <laughs> it could be, it could be. In cases like that, when you don't feel like, but don't, don't give a shit. But as a rule, you cannot allow, you cannot um, allow the luxury of being a coward, because they came, and you're supposed to spoon it out. You can do it. Even if you don't feel good, you're sick, or you don't feel bad, or just somebody said, your spiritual daughter comes and says, I don't want it! And you feel like, I'm beating the woman up! And you're saying, but still, you have to get the stir. They came, just because this woman came and, and ruined their life, that doesn't mean that I have to ruin others, or deprive others. Not at all. You sort of shut her up or step on toes, on her toes possible. <coughs> toes sometimes works very well. And um, you have to squeeze out and give that which to you is most important. Therefore, the key to that first element coming out is you might die and not and deprive them. Don't die, because there have been cases. Uh, there were the cases when a priest came out with finished liturgy. And he came in, and you know that when you put the holy uh, gifts with the saints, you know, and then you close, and the discus, you come out and you say the ascension, the, the idea of ascension, you ascend it, Jesus ascended. See? Then you take the chalice and make a sign of a cross, and you say, uh, what? Oh, at first, oh, at first, blessed is our God. <coughs> See? To yourself. And you turn around, and always, that's it. Always, and you don't go, and you just sense it. You have a sensor, if you have a deacon, or a deacon who doesn't sleep, or a sense, um, uh, some people don't know what they're talking about, 
and then finally you grab it yourself because it's impossible to wait, and you hold it and you take it then the sensor, and then you say the altar. And you turn around, hold it on the right hand side, remember? And when you bless that, there is now and ever, and it's leaving. The grace was just given, but it's leaving now. It's God. You receive it. You, re you become recipients. It's no more. It flies away. And you take it well, you go straight there, and you sense again, it's done. In other words, when the case that's what he was doing, did, he did it like that. He placed there, and he looked at the altar and collided. Mm -hmm. Just take it away. See? In other words, he did it. I sent, I sent, he did it. He put his heart, and he flew away. Just the body, not the character. Mm. That mm. See? Now, a priest is when he performs liturgy, he's dying. He actually slaughters himself. That's the best thing possible he'll ever do. He's, he sacrifices himself, pinched. If anybody gives him strength, fine, he can go on. It's not some automatic work you do, so sort of here and there, and you can do it again. Once, for example, you cannot serve liturgy more than once a day. You cannot. Just once a day, one person, once a day. And let's say you have, and you cannot have more the liturgy than one on one and see a day. Let's say you have lots of people, and you have two, uh, two um, holy tables, but one and see is just too bad, you can't do it. So there are two or three uh, holy tables, you have those two <coughs> and see that's the idea, because you live once. Because you can die, finished. See? Now, so point one, a priest cannot allow himself the liberty or the luxury of sort of saying, well, I don't feel like doing that. Besides, I don't deserve. I just stand there, there's chewing a big deal. Can't say that. Because no matter how insensitive, how cruel, how disgusting they are, and there's no doubt about that yet. See? Nevertheless, they had made an image of God, and they bore you. You came to church, not for you, but for God. You cannot not deprive them. Receiving Holy Communion is different. Not every, every day you should receive Holy Communion, because you're not worthy. But to hear the word of God is feeding. A priest must feed. If a, if a bishop does not give sermon three weekends in a row, he's supposed to expel, finished. He has to be speaking. Speaking or reading, if you can, so you can read, fine. Father Adrian often read. He would take the Father Eccles and read. And of course, make commentaries, comments which read. It was very effective. It's good, good words of saying Father Father Eccles, big thing. So, number one, he comes out <coughs> and introduces us first in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, now he's going to be not of this world. You are not bound up with the society of today's, all these problems. Therefore, Archbishop Abierki, who has taught us how that is, he said, first of all, get rid of your small interests, passions, your cigarettes, your um, Captain Crunch, like for uh, that so have to definitely say, avoid images of Captain Crunch, and so on. See? So he comes out, he talks, because this is now sort of ex cathedra, he is now bound up with the other world and he has to speak and lead them into another world. If you will lead them back again into this, this world, the fallen world, you are betraying them because the church is a threshold to the other world. So therefore, when you come out, you cannot continue sort of being the same way you are. You're different now. The Holy Spirit is bathing you into different. So you introduce a thought. You introduce and so on, and you look in their eyes. Father Michael has tendency, because he has great, great brain and deep thoughts and philosophic mind, you know, he's bound up with contest and so on. So it's a profound thing. So he open, comes up, closes his eyes, and just moves along, moves along, floats beautifully. It's okay. But one problem is that he doesn't see whether they hear him. You have to look, if your eyes show, you know, you have to look whether they get the point. At least a little bit. See, if they yawn 
At that moment when I start yawning, you, you increase the voice. Oh! <laughs> yeah. See? If they sneeze at the wrong time, you come up with Christian, the one word comes out. And you just like, build up the whole thing for five minutes, build it. And then one word comes out, you know? At this moment, somebody <laughs> kills the whole thing. Then it means to repeat it. If they sneeze again, repeat it again. Five, ten times. Until you finally pierce. Because you have to have control. What's going on? You have to give them, Jesus said, give them to eat. Their souls must be fed. If you have that and you want to give, then it'll reach. And therefore, homiletics is also bound up with feeding like the spiritual individual. On here he gives a common, a subject for common use. But also could be once in a while, let's say you have that particular problem or that particular, and so you have that in mind, see to it that that aspect is uh, covered nicely, so the person gets uh, in prison, I mean, what do you call it? Um, gets, um, <coughs> in, uh, what was that? Gets the point? Yeah, gets the point, was the um, incriminated. In other words, there's a problem here. <coughs> Touch a little so that it becomes, oh, whoa. Well. It maybe concerns me. <laughs> so you have to see what's going on. Father Michael is doing a great job, but he must open up his eyes, his blue heavenly eyes, on the people once in a while and see things. See? <coughs> it's nice to soar. It's correct. He's doing that. He soars. He opens his <coughs> mouth and begins soaring. And whether you're asleep or snoring, it makes no difference. He soars. See? <laughs> That's not good enough. He must be aware of what's going on. So number one, you come out there, you introduce or you peers, although you have the church, at the liturgical atmosphere, you nevertheless, um, like in Slavonic. Slavonic is a little different language. That's why it's very interesting when you come to church, there's a different language, and therefore the whole atmosphere becomes already otherworldly. Mm -hmm. Here we use the same language as we read newspapers. You just read Mickey Spillane a couple of chapters, and you read the murders in the, on the page, and then then the Father Madison's famous, uh, famous Dick, Dick Tracy and Blondie and um, a little Annie Orphan Annie. And then all of a sudden the same thing comes with the, with the sermon. It's not right. He must <coughs> abstain. So he introduces other worldliness. The atmosphere is charged with already and he must read. Otherwise it comes like I experienced. You come to church and just the, the moment that the message is finished, you just flee. Because the priest was going <coughs> to give you the world. And what would just gobble up all the great things that you felt. You understand? It's hard to expect from everybody. We have to be, um, you know, we have to be um, kind and compassionate. You know, we have to be compassionate. Too. <coughs> Nonetheless, the priests have to know this. Third point is when you introduce the ideas, these ideas must be applicable even indirectly to daily life. The art of introducing <coughs> other worldliness to the worldly print situations. You understand? <coughs> well, world. You know, it's so that people in the world can live with these ideas, <coughs> these other worldly ideas. <coughs> we can, in other words, we are, church is not to take a man out of the worldly situation and have some kind of escape. Church is not an escape. Liturgy, church services is otherworldly, but it is not an escape. Because you're supposed to lead a life, St. John of the St. John, Archbishop John said, each, each, what is it, each saint or each author, right? Man always had his <coughs> le, uh, uh, feet, uh, feet in the earth, in head, on in the earth. earth. Yeah, head in heaven, that's right. So therefore, you have to talk not to abstract. Uh, we have Father Gerasim, he uh, is a very talented man with a great sense of humor. And uh, his jokes are very funny. But they're very smart and very intelligent. So it not always strikes you right. And so usually it comes to that, he cracks a joke and there's total silence. <laughs> and about two weeks after, when you are in the most solemn moment serving for Yehida, it hits you. <laughs> and you can't stay from laughing because he cracked the joke two weeks ago. <laughs> Finally reached it. See, it's a talent. But, but uh, when it comes down to uh, this, you're supposed to have these images that you give, they're supposed to be, they should hit home. You understand what you're talking about. 
but not drag you to that level, to the Captain Crunch mentality. You understand? That's clear. Then, a four is when you want to, in other words, like in symphony, introductory one theme, introductory another theme, the, um, the, the combination or the, the crescendo, and then the result. So when the crescendo occurs, that is the time when you finally hit the point, what you want to say, the very essence. The point must be clear, so you get it right away, not like Father Gerasim's jokes. They take quite some time. That's, that's nice. It's very funny, especially during when you hear that, all of a sudden it hits you. And, uh, and you can't stop. And you are absolutely lost because it's really very funny. But you can't control it. It's very out of place. So the jokes should be at the same time. You know, when you crack a joke, and it has to be funny. Same thing, you hit the point, and, and it, people, it says to resonance. You hit them in the head, and it's supposed to resonate. People have to get the point. Now, this crescendo business can be a positive or a negative message. Say, you know, the positive, you talk like everything is, you know, like a sermon, you give something negative, right? And then you explain that this is a murder, spiritual murder. And then you come, therefore, beloved brother and son, don't do that. See? That will be already the conclusion. But this crescendo could be positive or negative. The negative in a sermon cannot have an appealing rapper. The negative message in the sermon cannot be in a positive rapper. In other words, there are some good, how can I put it? You understand? Make it no. appealing. No. It cannot you can't be appealing. Nice. Cannot be sugar coated. Cannot be sugar coated. Yeah. It has to be realistic. So the people say, the shudder is this negative thing. Like many good Hollywood movies, they give a good lesson, but negative. You know, some kind of a great thing. And a very negative lesson, like an heiress. It's a great movie called The Heiress. It's based on the novel Washington Square by um, James, or was it Henry James. And the production is one of the most superbest things humanity ever produced. See? But actually, it's a very negative thing. It's a story of a girl who got hurt by her unloving father, and she is going to be a witch, a sort of really mad individual. She's going to be hurting everybody because she hurts herself. And the last statement says, I am sort of evil because I have good teachers to be evil. See? So the whole message of this whole two hours to sit there and as a very psychological study, profound thing, excellent acting, the whole thing, every scene is, it's the art, superb. When you finish, you are actually deprived of peace of mind. See? Because it's a very negative thing. A sermon can never be true. You can talk about demons and so on. But demons have no power because Jesus is our king. See? All the bad things that happen, don't do this, don't do that. That's true. But you therefore have God. Do this, what God tells you. Do you understand? You get that's very important. Then <coughs> The positive uh, input should be devoid of earthly, passionate thing in it. In other words, because your sermon is not of this world, it cannot be um, presented in a positive, um, in a passionate way, then it becomes attractive. You cannot sort of tempt them in the sermon with something positive, which I mean, something attractive, which is which is um, passion. Like I said, something bad shouldn't have the passion, and something good cannot be worthy. Cannot be. Let's say you talk about lust and then give images of lust and describe here and there. It cannot be. You understand? Because you have to lead them out of this world. And finally, in the conclusion, you must by looking at them, their eyes. <coughs> By seeing how they, you must lift them up. Father Adrian, at the end, when the crescendo will come after the crescendo, you can feel his rising, almost on tiptoes, because he lifts you up out of this world. You get the dose, you get what you're not, and he lifts you up. He becomes more silent, and sometimes 
Amen. And you feel you sort of lift it up. See? In other words, the, they say St. John of uh, St. John Christopher, when he gave uh, his homilies, they were so inspiring and so overwhelming that people who couldn't resist, they would applaud. Ah, right there in church. Right in the great they couldn't. He was that's why he was called Golden Mouth. Chrysostom means golden mouth. And it was a woman who stood, simple woman who stood, listened to him. Finally, she couldn't resist it. She screamed at the top of her lungs. Why you are a golden mouth? <laughs> and he remained like that forever. That was it. You know, it's, he was so overwhelming that she couldn't, she was just swept off her feet. Because she was filled with what? He was filled with love and be filled with theology. Yeah. Repeat that. He was filled with love and filled with theology. Exactly. But you look at them on that. Now, so the final <coughs> the, uh, sermon ends <coughs> on a man. Some people say, Robinson say, in the name of the uh, name of Jesus. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, or Father bless or something like that. That is, that is Protestant an idea. But Orthodox idea is just simply amen and let the souls soar. Not everybody has, uh, you know, talent. What do you do that? Yes. How long? Depends on your mood. <coughs> For example, if you are like Father Michael, you close your eyes and you are deeply concerned and you have images of Father Comptas, you can go on for hours and hours because you don't see what's going on. And finally open up your eyes, the church is empty. <laughs> <laughs> so then the person must <laughs> control yourself. So, or you, let's say, you start speaking, and it's such a boredom that everybody's walking out, even though you look at them, and you raise your voice, but it's so bored, and everybody looks at just, see? Then, quiz it out soon. They say no more than seven minutes. See? In other words, you say maximum in minimum of time. But don't gobble up. That is, give them, you are giving them food, spiritual food. And I say again, sermon is required of each service, but Holy Communion not. We have sermons usually bound up with only with liturgy. But actually, after each <coughs> reading of the gospel, and if this should be a sermon, understand? We did it with Father Self, even though there was almost nobody in the church, we did it every time, although we're not priests. Again. <coughs> now, at the end I said, you, into it, finally you sort of come to conclusion, and you were looking at them, and you sort of addressed in the love of brothers and sisters, and so on, so on, so on, and then you left them <coughs> They become full people. 